Thank you, Nancy. Well, good evening, good evening. and welcome. It's good to have you here tonight, and those that have come personally, we appreciate that, but also those that are watching online, we want to welcome those as well. Thank you for being with us. My name is Ed Koteski, and I'm filling in for Pastor Andy, who is in Kansas enjoying a brand new granddaughter. So we celebrate with him this good news, and we hope and pray that Pastor Andy and Stephanie will relax and enjoy their time with family. But let's begin this evening's worship with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do count it a privilege to be with you and here tonight with these fellow believers in Christ. Thank you, Lord, for these brothers and sisters. And Lord, we just pray that you will speak to our hearts and our lives as we sing these hymns and choruses of praise and hear your word. Lord, minister to us and may we go out from here and then may you minister through us to minister to a world that's hurting and lost. And uh, Lord, we know that you came to seek and to save that which was lost. And now that is our ministry, Lord, to go and seek those that are hurting and lost and need salvation. And Lord, may we proclaim the name of Jesus proudly. May we not be ashamed of the gospel. And Lord, may we honor him in all that we say and do and how we live our lives and all that we uh, do in our attitudes and actions. May it reflect the spirit of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We love you tonight, Lord, and thank you for your goodness and grace. Thank you again for the privilege it is to be here. May we never take these freedoms for granted. In Jesus' name, amen. The ladies and I practiced a new song. It's a peppy little song. It's not hard to learn. So we want you to sing along with it. The words will be up there. The name of the song is Sweeter As The Days Go By. Now, who am I talking about when I say sweeter as the days go by? Who gets sweeter? Jesus. He does. He's the best friend you'll ever have. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And I have some great brothers, but I'm so glad I know Jesus, and he does get sweeter as the days go by. Richer, deeper, fuller, sweeter. 
Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, that is the cry of our heart, how great you are and how great you have been to us. Lord, you have been so good and gracious to us, far, far better than we ever deserve. Lord, we deserve none of the goodness that you lavish on us. But Lord, we stand before you tonight with grateful hearts. Thank you, Lord, for the salvation we have in Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that he went to the cross for our sins and guilt. But thank you, Lord, for the resurrection the great validating event, the yes, validating everything you said and did. Lord, we just thank you for this resurrection season that we live in. We thank you, Lord, for the salvation that we have in Jesus, the life that he gives us with hope and meaning and purpose, a life worth living. It's not the kind of life the world gives, nor can take away. But Lord, we just thank you that we not only have life here and now, but life everlasting with you. And Lord, we know that it's gonna be worth it all when we see Jesus. And Lord, in the meantime, we know that there are many hurts and needs among us. We pray for those, Lord, that are sick, that are hurting, that have special physical needs. Lord, we know that you know each one. We know that you care for each one. And Lord, we know that you know each burden, whether it be a physical need or a financial one. But also, Lord, we know that you are Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And Lord, we pro pray that you will provide the healing and hope and meet each need according to your will. Lord, we pray for all of the families and marriages and, and the kids and the peer pressures that they deal with day in and day out. Lord, we pray that you will draw close to them and let them sense your presence and your power. Be with all of the, our, our family units here, Lord. Every mom and dad, son and daughter, sister, brother, grandpa and grandma, aunt and uncle. Lord, we pray that you will draw close and may each one feel and sense the presence of God. Lord, we pray for those that are in nursing homes, tonight, those that are in hospitals, those that would love to be here but are unable to. We thank you, Lord, for those that are watching online and you know the unique needs that they have and we pray for your blessings to be upon them. We pray for our pastor and Stephanie, Lord. Thank you for giving them a safe trip and what a blessed time it is for them. And Lord, we pray for their family, this precious new granddaughter, and may she grow up following faithfully the ways of the Lord. And Lord, we thank you for these blessed events. And Lord, we pray for the, our nation, and Lord, we sometimes don't know how to pray, but Lord, we come to you and you hear the groanings of our heart and you intercede on our behalf. But we do pray, Lord, that our leaders will have godly wisdom, guidance, and grace. And Lord, we do lift them to you as we are commanded in the Bible to pray for those in authority. So Lord, we just pray for our nation and may we not take the freedoms that we enjoy for granted. And Lord, we also know that not only are you there for the hurts and needs of life, but Lord, thank you for the many, many joys you have lavished on us. Thank you, Lord, for the simple pleasures, the, the beauty of the days and the ability to, to enjoy them, to get out and, and be here. And uh, Lord, we just wanna take time to express our gratitude for all that you have done in our lives, freeing us from sin and guilt, but also, Lord, just the love that we can show others and receive from others. Thank you, Lord, for these in the body of Christ, these brothers and sisters. And Lord, as our church moves forward into the future, we pray that you will be with the Turners as they come and may they settle into their ministry here and may they be a breath of fresh air and, 
And uh, Lord, may our church see growth in number and in spirit, not for statistics sakes, but, but because lost souls are being saved. We pray, Lord, that we will see souls saved and sanctified holy and all of us strengthened and encouraged in the faith. Lord, minister not only to us tonight, but through us as we leave. May others see Jesus in us and let us live to give you praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you think you ladies could sing that, Oh, How Great Thou Art Again? Yes. with me at this time in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 27, Matthew 27 verses 50 and 51. I want to go back to Jesus hanging on the cross. I want to go back to that terrible Friday that we call good. It was good for us. Jesus is hanging on the cross. His life is about to go out of him. In verse 50, Matthew 27, 50 says, And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. You can stop right there. So the moment that Jesus died, the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll add your blessing to the reading of the word and let it sink deep within our hearts. Open our hearts and minds to receive it, and may we put it into practical application and live out its truths. In thy name we pray, amen. amen. There's an extremely important event which happened the moment that Jesus breathed his last. And it doesn't get a lot of verses. It only takes a couple of sentences to describe, but nevertheless, its importance cannot be underestimated. This is huge. The Bible says that when Jesus gave up his spirit, or when he breathed his last, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, this was no ordinary curtain. This was the curtain that partitioned off or separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. This temple curtain hung down about 60 feet. So it's a sizable curtain. And the woven fabric of threads had threads of gold and silver. They contained 72 twisted braids of 24 threads each. Now, I don't know what that is. Maybe some of you who sew and quilt and do all those exciting things know more about how thick that is. But I've read different accounts and you know, there's never any shortage of accounts. 
But one account I read said that this curtain was so thick and strong that it could possibly be as the width or the thickness of the palm of a man's hand. I read another account that said if you had two horses pulling that way and two horses pulling that way, it could not tear that curtain apart. So we are not talking about some flimsy threadbare sheet here. We are not talking about the sheets you throw on the guest bed when company comes. We are talking about a strong, tough, rich, elegant curtain that cannot be torn by man. That's the point. This curtain was not torn by man. This curtain covered an opening of 30 feet wide, so it's 60 feet tall, 30 feet wide, and again, it separated the sanctuary from the inner cubicle room called the inmost place, or the Holy of Holies. And behind this huge curtain was the room considered to be the dwelling place of God's presence, or we could look at it like this. Yes, God was omnipresent, but in the people's mind, that was kind of the, the highest concentration where God dwelled in the Holy of Holies. Now, in the original temple built by Solomon, the Ark of the Covenant was kept in the Holy of Holies. This was an ornate, you know, you've seen pictures uh, where the wings of the angels, the cherubim, would, would come up and touch, and actually that area was the highest intensity of the presence of God. But nevertheless, on top of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat where the blood of an innocent, unblemished lamb was poured out. And the ritual sacrifice was for the atonement of the sins of God's people. Once a year, the high priest, after strict ceremonial cleansing, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies behind the curtain. However, centuries before Jesus came, the Ark of the Covenant was lost or stolen or hidden. We don't know what has happened to the Ark of the Covenant. Um, more speculation there, interesting stuff, but we just don't know what happened to the Ark. But the high priest, nevertheless, would continue his rituals even though the ark wasn't there. Rituals empty of themselves but symbolic of Christ, the real Lamb of God, who will and did take away the sin of the world and shed his blood. But now, suddenly, at the moment of Jesus' death on the cross, that great curtain is ripped in two from top to bottom. Now, what does this mean? The ripping was meant to show that there is no more separation between God and man. So that no one could explain away the incident, the massive curtain was torn from top to bottom. And this ripping, let me emphasize, came from God, not man. Man could not have done this. It came from the top down. And in this unveiling, we learn some beautiful things about God's heart of love. Now, Pastor Andy says that all good sermons have to have three points. So I've done my best this evening to get, a, get three points. Point number one, the torn curtain demonstrates God's approachability. God's approachability. You see, in that day, people believed that the curtain of the temple had excluded ordinary men and women from God. Everyone but the high priest was kept outside, and only the high priest could go in there one day of the year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So everybody else was, was outside, and there was always a certain mystery that hid God. 
or the heart of God. Now that mystery is gone. You see, when Jesus died, that curtain was torn in two. Light flooded through the gloomy darkness of the Holy of Holies. Excluded mankind was now admitted. The whole world was brought inside to the Holy of Holies. Through the torn curtain, the way was now open to the very presence of God for everyone. The curtain is open wide to the presence of God. Come on in. One and all, whosoever will, may come. Now no man can stand between us and God. We do not need to go through an intermediary priest to get to God. We don't need to go through another. Jesus himself is our high priest. He is the one, the only one. There is no other intermediary we need. In Christ, every person has direct access to the presence of God. The torn curtain is God's visible invitation to approach him. He throws back the curtain and invites us, come on in. And the tearing of the curtain represents the removal of all barriers and difficulties in our approach to God. Divisions between priest and worshiper have been erased. Jesus' church, remember, is a priesthood of believers. You have direct access to God through Christ. And the Bible says in Ephesians 2, it speaks about those who have felt excluded and without hope and without God saying, but now, Paul transitions here, but now in Christ, Jesus, you, have, you once were far away, but now have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations." For through him, we both have access, we have both access to the Father by one spirit. And since God opened the way, we can enter his presence with boldness. We don't have to come groveling, but we can come as his children toward a loving father. And the book of Hebrews says in chapter 10, therefore brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. Wow. The approachability of God is at the very heart of the Christian faith. God has not shut you out. In fact, the opposite is true. The opposite has happened. He invites you into his presence, into his forgiveness, into his grace, into his redeeming work through Jesus Christ. Come on in, he says. The book of Hebrews also says, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The torn curtain demonstrates the approachability of God. He, his door is open, wide open, and he says, come on in. Point number two, the torn curtain demonstrates God's availability. Yes, God is available. Not only is God approachable, he's available. Any time, any place. Because in the thinking of the people of that day, God's presence, remember, was kind of sort of confined to the Holy of Holies. Yes, he was omnipresent, but if you really wanted to, you know, get to God, you had to go to the priest through, you know, oh, it's, no, God never wanted to be in a box. He is not in a box. 
He was not in a box in reality, but the people kind of understood it, kind of, sort of, that way. God never intended for us to have a secondary approach to his presence, but the priesthood developed into that. When Jesus died, God tore that curtain from above to make it known to the world that he wanted out, so to speak. He did that to illustrate he's out. He's no longer in the box. He did not want us to think of him as located only in a certain place, therefore unavailable. You got to do this or you got to go through him or that. He is available anytime, anywhere, without an intermediary. He wanted us to know we can worship him anytime, any place, in spirit and in truth. God is on call and available whenever and wherever we need him. And we need him all the time. Whenever and wherever we are, we need God. Wherever we are, God is. He is ready and willing to communicate with us. And we can find God anywhere, everywhere. Ah, but be careful. We can also miss him anywhere if we're not careful. See, sin is a great hindrance. Sin is a barrier. Sin separates us from God. However, the good news is that when God tore the curtain, he did not rip just a little piece off the corner. God tore it right down the middle, 60 feet high, and spread it wide open. He didn't just tear a little bit off so we could peek in. No, he ripped it from top to bottom, a big enough entrance for the greatest of sinners to go through. No matter who you are or what you've done, you can come to God and find forgiveness through repentance and faith. If it had been only a tiny little hole that was ripped, yeah, maybe a few lesser offenders could kind of creep through and find God's forgiveness. But God performed an act of abounding mercy. The curtain was completely torn right down the middle so that even the chief of sinners is made available to God's love, compassion, and saving grace. The torn curtain demonstrates the fact that we can live in the presence of God. We do. We live in the presence of God. Every day, he is here. He is with us. He's in our homes. God is always available. You can come to him anytime and any place, and he can come to you at any time, at any place. There was a a shabby old man that used to come into a certain church every day about noon. And he wouldn't stay long. He'd just walk through the open doors and come down to the front before the altar. And he would pray a short prayer and then he would leave. And one day the pastor asked him why he did this. And the man replied, well, I come here to pray. The pastor said, but you really don't stay very long. I've watched you. You just come down to the altar and stay a few minutes and leave. And the old man smiled and said, yeah, that's true. I do not pray very long, but every day around noon, I come in and I say to Jesus, Jesus, it's Jim. I'm just checking in to tell you I love you. Well, Jim didn't show up for a couple of weeks. The pastor was worried about him. The pastor missed him. And the pastor found out that he was hit by a car and was in the hospital. And the pastor went to visit him and found him in a poverty ward with a bunch of other men, mostly homeless. But before entering the room, the nurse told the pastor that this used to be the roughest, dirtiest, meanest ward in the hospital. The men grumbled and complained. They would argue with each other. They would yell at the nurses. They wouldn't 
take their medicine, they wouldn't eat the food. But since Jim has come, there's a whole new atmosphere here. Jim has a positive attitude and, and a warm-hearted sense of humor. He's changed just about everybody in that room. Whatever Jim has, wow, whatever goodness he carries is contagious. And the nurse said, the funny thing about it is, Pastor, Jim says it's all because of his visitor. But Pastor, I kind of wanted to tell you, I don't know about this because you're the only visitor that Jim has had. Nobody else has come to see him. You're the first one. So when the pastor went in and sat by Jim's bed, the pastor asked, how is it, Jim, that you brought such harmony and happiness to this room? Oh, Jim says, it's all because of my visitor. Now, Jim, the nurse said you haven't had any visitors. Oh, but the nurse is wrong, said Jim. Every day at noon, the Lord Jesus comes to the foot of my bed and he says, Jim, this is Jesus. I'm just checking in to tell you I love you. You see, you can come to him at any time, at any place, and he also can come to you and does any time, any place. Isn't it wonderful we have a God who comes to us? He is available. He is approachable. Come. And not only does he say come, he says, I will come. And he does. Number three, the torn curtain demonstrates the loving heart of God. When Jesus bowed his head and died, God tore the curtain from top to bottom, symbolically exposing the loving heart of God, his heart of sorrow, his suffering love. Now, let me illustrate what I mean by this because you, you often see this in the Old Testament. But what did Jacob do? The father of Joseph, Old Testament, book of Genesis. What did Jacob do when he saw the multicolored coat of his beloved son, Joseph, drenched in goat's blood, and convinced by the other boys that, that Joseph must be dead. I mean, you remember how his other brothers sold him into slavery down off to Egypt? And they said, hey, we got to come up with a story. What happened to him? We're going to come home without our brother. Ah, let's say an animal got him. So they took that multicolored coat that they were jealous of. They were jealous of Joseph, and they drenched it in goat's blood, and they went back and told their dad, oh, he must have been eaten by an animal, and this is all that's left of him. Wow, can you imagine doing that? It broke Jacob's heart. So anyway, the Bible says Jacob tore his garment, tore his robe as an expression of his deep sorrow. He reached up and ripped his clothes from the top down, bearing his broken-hearted chest. Also, what did jo uh, Job do when he got the shocking news of the death of his children? Job also ripped his clothes from top to bottom as an expression of his deepest sorrow, exposing his broken heart. So when God tore the curtain from top to bottom, he demonstrated to Jesus' followers that he is not distant, he is not unfeeling, he is not some transcendent other out there far away. No, he is as close as the mention of his name he is here. He is with us. God's heart is full of love. The Bible says God is love. He did not coldly send his son to a cross. His heart was full of sorrow to watch him die. He loves you and he loves me so much that he willingly allowed his grieving heart to be broken. Through Christ, God showed his suffering love. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You can trust God to reach across the great gulf of your sins and bridge the broken relationship through the cross. You can talk to him, confess any sin, every failure, every frustration, anytime, anywhere. That torn curtain tells us that God is approachable, that God is available, that God has a heart full of love for you and me. Goethe said, if I were God, this world of sin and suffering would break my heart. Well, when Jesus died bearing our sins, it did break God's heart to see his son suffer and die on a cross, but he knew it would be worth it if it brought us back to him. The Bible says in 1 John, this is how God showed his love among us in this. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Through Christ's death on the cross, this torn curtain tells us that God is personally, we can have a wonderful personal relationship with him. He is personally available. God is personally approachable. And God has a heart full of love for you and me. What better way to demonstrate it than that? The curtain is wide open. He is here. And he goes with you always to the very end of the age. And I've asked Nancy to come and lead us in a couple of more songs. Oh, how he loves you and me.
Shall we stand as we are dismissed? Our precious <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for sending him to seek and to save us who are lost, to give us life, abundant life eternal. Thank you, Lord, that he is our high priest. We can go to him anytime, any place. And Lord, we just Thank you so much for your heart full of love. Thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son to be our savior. And thank you, Lord, that we can have direct access to you through him. Thank you, Lord, for being available. Thank you, Lord, for being approachable. And thank you again and again for showing us your heart full of love. And it's all because of Jesus. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Amen.